Greetings, Remnant Church. Welcome to this week's Midweek Refuel, where we are currently reading Augustine's Confessions. We seek out the old and ancient Christian writings in order to better understand our current spiritual warfare. Like last week, this week focuses again on young Olypius. And if you will recall, Olypius was dragged away into addiction by his so-called friends, uh, and that happened in last week's reading. This week, we find Olypius getting accused of a crime, and it's a crime that he did not commit, but it looked like he did. So the image that is being painted for us by Augustine is of a very young and promising Olypius getting tried and tested by life and by God, both by desire and injustice. Olypius is going through a hard time, and Olypius seems to be surrounded by hard times, and not just hard times, but unfair times as well. Sometimes unfair times can feel worse than hard times. In last week's reading, Augustine tells us precisely what is happening with Olypius. He writes, quote, You, however, O Lord, who preside over the direction of all the things you have created, did not forget that he, Olypius, would be a priest of your sacrament among your children. And you worked through me, but without my knowledge, so that his amendment would be ascribed to yourself, unquote. God had plans for young Olypius, and God would use whatever God needed to use to make these plans happen. Uh, back again to the, uh, where is the line between God's omnipotence and your free will? I believe in free will, but at the same time, I don't believe it matters much. God would achieve these plans uh, through mentors like Augustine, but he would also achieve his plans and his designs through afflicting the ore of Olypius with trials of fire. Or to put it more bluntly, when God is going to use someone for his purposes, they must be purified through the fire. Moses had to be purified at the burning bush. Isaiah had his lips purified with live coal. Uh, even the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ, had a trial by fire in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, I, I just got finished teaching a series that included the Joseph cycle. Joseph is a, a beautiful and mysterious figure to me. He works the will of God through the city of man by submitting to the injustices of a sin-stained reality. He literally gets punched up to the highest position in the land. Uh, I read stories like uh, The Hiding Place, and I find tales uh, of spiritual giants within places like Auschwitz, who at first glance seem like to the world like just trafficked mice. But you read these stories and all of a sudden they become grander and bolder and more heroic than any other figure that's walked through history. Three men uh, refuse to bow down and king makes them pass through the fire. Daniel passes through his trial by fire uh, in a lion's den. It's not always fire. It's the symbol of fire. And most of us spend our lives begging God to be saved from the fire. And I'm not sure it would be a sane or healthy thing for us to invite the fire or long for the fire. That's not what I'm saying. What I think, though, is that we should get to a spiritual place in our lives and, and uh, through our spiritual development where we can at least submit to the fire when God allows the fire and face it. As a child who is learning a valuable lesson through discipline instead of as a spoiled child who refuses to be disciplined uh, or who refuses to learn his multiplication tables, uh, simply submitting to the fact that God is in ultimate control and ultimate charge and that God does indeed love you can alleviate a good bit of anxiety and fear out of your life. Getting there, 
getting to that spot will sometimes require, like in the Garden of Gethsemane, that you get down and you sweat blood for the for the right to this knowledge. But the you that passes through the fire, the you that survives the journey will be imbued from on high with power and insight and wisdom for the next leg of your spiritual purpose. Your time in the garden is getting you ready for your time at Golgotha. Your time at Golgotha is getting you ready for your time outside of an empty tomb. After surviving his ordeal and being exonerated from his charges, Olypius is a different man. He is a better man. He is a more patient man, and he is less likely to make assumptions because assumptions is what got him into his trouble. His trial through fire has made him better, not worse, because he's choosing blessing, not choosing curse. You choose curse, this could devastate you. You choose blessing, well, let's pay attention to Olypius and what Augustine says about him. Augustine writes, quote, Olypius himself, the future steward of your word, an arbiter of so many cases in your church, departed a more experienced man and a better prepared for his ta task, unquote. But Olypius is more than just an honest guy. He's more than just what you and I would call a good guy. Olypius is being molded by God into something better than a good guy. He is being turned into a hero of the kingdom, a knight of the table. It is one thing to do the right thing when it costs you nothing. It is a wholly other thing to do the right thing when it could cost you everything. It's easy to be good when people are watching, but are you good when you're alone? Do you see an opportunity for gain and take it no matter how crooked? If you think you will get away with it? Just like today, there seem to have been two tiers of justice in ancient Carthage. One system of justice for those who had to throw themselves on the mercy of the courts, like you and me, and another system of justice for those that could buy their way out of trouble, like other people we know. Take the money, take the money, and you profit, while a rich guy gets his kicks doing something illegal but only self-destructive. It's win-win, right? Take the money. Well, it depends on if you're a hero or not, doesn't it? A good person might take the money, a hero will not. Heroes do not profit by breaking the rules. Heroes also weigh out in their minds which path is the most virtuous when two or more paths seem open and when all the paths seem in some different way to be morally acceptable or beneficial. The hero always, always, always takes the highest road, especially when the highest road cost them personally, uh, whether uh, uh, subtracting from them currently or subtracting from them what they might have gained had they gone a little crooked when defending the rights and peace of those around them. Heroes, heroes pick up their cross daily and heroes say no to themselves daily. Heroes put justice and virtue over mammon and riches. Augustine writes of Olypius, quote, He found more remarkable those who put gold before innocence. Even his character was tested, and not only by the lure of greed, but by the impulse of fear, unquote. In order to pass over from an average good citizen to a superhero, one must have their characters tested by both greed and fear. Heroes must, must, must be able to deny themselves, but they must also be able to do more. They also must be able to sacrifice themselves. That is the true difference between a good person and a hero.
John 15, 13 says this, quote, Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends, unquote. Listen to how people, even Augustine, respond to a hero. Quote, threats were made, Olympias despised them, and all were amazed at this extraordinary soul, which neither sought as a friend nor feared as an enemy, a man so powerful with so many countless means of assisting him or injuring him, and with such an enormous reputation, unquote. In other words, the people were impressed with Olypius because Olypius told a giant of a man, go get bent. <laughs> Olympius could have made a valuable friend who could turn misdeeds into money, but Olypius chose to have an enemy rather than to offend his own consciousness or have something between him and God, or to deviate from virtue and truth. He followed the virtuous path. Our culture is in need of people who will begin again to walk the virtuous path no matter the price. Our culture is in desperate need of heroes. We need at least one hero in every home, one hero in every church, one hero in every marriage, one hero on every school board, one hero in every White House and Waffle House. We need some heroes. We need people who will show a culture what it is like to sacrifice willingly and walk the high road proudly. We need gentle men and gentle women again. Olypius must decide, and of him it is written, quote, But on considering where justice lay, he turned his mind to higher things. A judging equity, which forbade him to do so, better than the authority which allowed him. Unquote. Let's turn to book six, chapters nine through ten. You can get a copy for free by doing a quick uh, duck, duck, go search or uh, doing a, a search on the Gutenberg press site. But for the time being, this incident was stored up in his memory for his future healing. There was another incident also one afternoon while he was still studying under me at Carthage. He was in the market square running over the recitation he was to give, the, the usual student exercise, and you allowed him to be apprehended by the market wardens as a thief. For no other reason, I suppose, our God, than because you wanted someone who was to be such an important person to begin at an early age to learn how reluctant one human being should be to condemn another out of rash credulity. It happened like this. He was strolling about in front of the courthouse with his writing tablets and pencils when a youth, one of the student body and the real thief, entered the courthouse without Olypius's knowing, carrying a concealed axe and went to the leaden railings that overhang the silversmith street and began to hack away at the lead. The silversmiths underneath, however, hearing the noise of the axe, put their heads together and sent out a party to apprehend anyone they might find up there. The thief, hearing their voices, abandoned his axe and made off, afraid of being caught with it. Olypius, however, who had not seen him going in, noticed him coming out and saw him making off in a hurry and wondering why he entered the courthouse and found the axe. As he stood looking at it in puzzlement, the party dispatched by the silversmiths arrived and found him by himself carrying the axe whose sound had aroused them to come. They seized him, dragged him off, and in front of a crowd of Market Square regulars, they boasted of having caught a thief in the act. From there, they took him to be presented before the court. But that was as far as his lesson was to go. You, O oh Lord, the sole witness of, it, of his innocence, immediately came to his aid. As he was being taken off either to prison or to corporal punishment, his party happened to encounter a certain architect, the curator-in-chief of public works. The arrest party were especially pleased to have, have met him because they were often suspected by him of the theft of items which had disappeared from the market square. Now at last he would know who had done it, 
but the architect had often seen Olypius at the house of one of the senators, to whom he used to go every morning to make his courtesy greeting, and recognized him straight away. Grabbing him by the hand, he took him aside from the crowd and asked him what had caused all this unpleasant business. On hearing what had happened, he ordered those present, who were all in a state of uproar and threatening violence against him, to come with him. They came to the house of the youth who had committed the crime. There was a slave boy in front of the door, but so young that he would be not be afraid of his master's behalf of their questions, and could easily reveal all having, in fact, been his master's attendant in the market square. Olypius remembered it, and immediately indicated as much to the architect who then showed the boy the axe and asked who it was. Without hesitation, the boy said, ours. On further questioning, he disclosed the remaining details. Thus, while the investigations were concentrated on that house instead, and the crowds, who had prematurely begun to celebrate Olypius's capture, were put to confusion. Olypius himself, the future steward of your word and arbiter of so many cases in your church, departed a more experienced man and better prepared for his task. So it was that I found him at Rome, and he attached himself to me with the strongest of bonds, and left for Rome, uh, left Rome for Milan with me, both so as not to desert me and to gain some experience in the practice of law which he had studied, though more in accordance with his parents' wishes than his own. Three times he acted as clerk to the justice and behaved with a restraint, with a self-restraint, which others found remarkable. Whereas he found more remarkable those who put gold before innocence, even his character was tested, and not only by the lure of greed, but by the impulse of fear. At Rome, he was acting as court clerk to the count of the Italian largest. There was at that time a very powerful senator who had many men indebted to him for his good offices towards them and subject to their terror of him. He, as is customary with the powerful, wanted permission for something not permitted by law. Olypius resisted him. A reward was offered. Olypius laughed at it in his heart. Threats were made. Olypius despised them, and all were amazed at this extraordinary soul which neither sought as a friend nor feared as an enemy, a man so powerful with so many countless means of assisting him or injuring him and with such an enormous reputation. The judge to whom Olypius was acting as clerk, although he too was reluctant to grant the permission sought, did not refuse openly but laid the blame on Olypius, saying that he would not let him grant the permission, and quite rightly, for he had done so. Olypius would have left the court. Only one thing came close to enticing Olypius, and that was his enthusiasm for literature. He could have had codices copied out for himself at palace expense, but on considering where justice lay, he turned his mind to higher things, a judging equity, which forbade him to do so better than the authority which allowed him. This is a small matter, but he who is faithful in a small matter will be faithful in a great matter also. Nor will the word that proceeds from the mouth of your truth be proved empty. If you are not faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will give you true mammon? And if you are unfaithful in another's property, who will give you what is your own? Such was he who attached himself to me at that time and agreed with me when we took counsel on what manner of life we should keep. Nebridius, Nebridius, too, had abandoned his home ne town near Carthage, had abandoned Carthage itself, where he was a very frequent visitor, had abandoned his fine ancestral estate, had abandoned his home and his mother who would not follow him, and had come to Milan for the sole purpose of sharing with me a life of burning zeal for truth and wisdom.
He sighed no less than Olypius and I, and no less than we did, wavered in uncertainty, ardent seeker though he was for the blessed life, and keenest investigator of the most difficult questions. There were three of us, three hungry mouths sighing to each other over their scant resources and looking to you to give them food in due season. And in every bitterness that in accordance with your mercy pursued our worldly actions when we considered the end for which we suffered all these things, we were confronted with darkness and we turned away groaning and saying, how long? Long will all this last? This we said often, but in so saying, we did not abandon the things that made us suffer. For no certain object had emerged, which, having abandoned the rest, we might hold on to. The world is in desperate need of heroes and in desperate need of gentle men and gentle women. If God has decided that you are worthy to be put through the fire, then stand firm in it. Lift your head and still your heart. There will be a fourth man and press on through to the end. Your hero's journey has just begun. You will find that once you have survived the fiery chrysalis, you will mount up with wings like an eagle. And like all saints of all time, your testimony will also be your origin story. Christ is my hero. Christ is king. Hey, to the king.